everyone to our ERL <laughs> seminar. Um, yeah, so I'm going to introduce our speaker today, John Hubbard, who most of you know very well. But yeah, John got his PhD in electrical engineering from CSU. I'm not going to say when. <laughs> and it was already on work with radars, and he actually did his work in collaboration with DLR, which is the German Aerospace Agency, and he spent some time in Germany doing that. After that, he became a research associate at CSU and then an affiliate professor before he came here to NCAR as a project scientist in 2002. And his moved through the ranks as project scientist. He's currently a project scientist four. He's also the leader of the NextRed data quality project, and he has done that for several years now, which is a pretty big deal. It's a, it's a big um, funding source. And he has also, he's also um, the lead scientist for our SPOL radar. He has won numerous awards and he has some patents and some of them are actually related to clutter mitigation. So he received the Anchor's um, Technical Achievement Award for his clutter mitigation decision um, technique. And he also has a patent that is related to clutter filtering. And so we are excited to hear what is new with clutter filtering. We think, and we are rethinking cloud filtering today. So. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ricky, for that introduction. So, I, I found I've been doing this uh, research now for the past couple of years, and I, I found it quite quite interesting. It's it's something now. Looking at it, you'll maybe you'll say, "Well, this is very obvious," but it was so obvious somehow that it was missed by the radar community and why they walked over this technique. Well, I will give you some, uh, you know, maybe hints, but this is what I think anyway. So rethinking clutter filtering and improving signal statistics. And there is Yoda uh, thinking away. So in the beginning, so you have to start in the beginning on these things, right? So in the beginning, there was ground clutter and there really wasn't much we could do about it. Here is a, here is an image from SPO and all of this all of this uh, stuff here are, are looking to the east, and there's S-Pole, there's the Rocky Mountains. And, you know, back in the, back in the beginning, 70s, 80s, you know, there really wasn't much clutter mitigation even possible. And we kind of had to live it, live with that stuff. And so what did we do? Well, we, we conquered a good part of that by just radar location. So there is the radar in this green thing here is, is representing a depression in the landscape. And so you'd put our, we'd put the radar on the depression in the landscape such that the horizon would block the uh, side lobes. And then once the main lobe would clear over the horizon, it, it would be you know, hitting cl clutter-free environment. And that actually you know, works fairly well. And, and even to this day, when we go try to locate a radar, we try to find a, uh, a beneficial location like this. But then in the 80s, digital computers made possible IIR and FIR filters, but there were drawbacks to these things. There was filter warm-up, um, uh, conditioning the signal before you came to the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the sequence, uh, what to do at the beginning and the end of, of these sequences with, with this data flowing in and out of these, of these filters. And we were stuck with either you know, filter everywhere or no filtering because we didn't have the means to turn off, you know, the, our, our, we didn't have the computer power yet to do that. AP clutter was especially problematic. And, you know, this was really the state of the, uh, uh, of the art getting up when I came on to NCAR in 2001, 2002. Well, in the 2000s, we got even faster processes. Uh, Sigmet's RVP-8, I'm sure many of you maybe have heard of this. It was the, adopted by the National Weather Service to put on our national network of radars. Sigia and Passarelli, and they published in ERAD 2004 their GMAP algorithm, Gaussian Model Adaptive Processing. Uh, and it's a spectral-based 
of uh, Doppler velocity processing routine, and it, it, th- these faster processes made FFTs in real time possible. And so that was really cool because you can put an FFT onto a signal, and then you can take a look at that spectrum. And it's really nice because it's visual. We love visual stuff. It was a very attractive algorithm, and I'll tell you about it. And it, w- it was put on RVP8, and that's the way that the weather service went, and so they adopted that type of a clutter filter. Well, so it's spectral-based clutter filtering. So this is a bit of a repeat, this slide. So since the advent of fast digital receivers, this has been the standard. Most people have adapted this type of a, adopted this type of a filter. Um, it's very, very common in weather radar. So let's take a look at what is GMAP processing. Well, here's a picture. This is actual clutter signal that you would see looking at ESPO. It's, pretty, it's a pretty sizable uh, a clutter signal. And you see, many of these have this kind of interesting tent shape uh, 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 features to them, and, and I'll explain why in a minute. And so, but part of the GMAP processing is is that you have to use a window, and I'll talk about that extensively, a window on the time domain signal. And once you take and window that time domain signal and then do an FFT on it, look what happens to that clutter signal. It all gets pulled in to the center, and look what's, look where the noise floor is on those two signals. One's at 20, minus 20 dB. You, you drove that noise floor down 40 dB. That's pretty impressive. And so then, what do you, and so all GMAP does is go in, and there's some techniques about how to make, you know, how wide this knot should be, because obviously nobody looks at these things gate to gate. You have to have that automated. But once you identify where that clutter is, as designated by those dotted lines, you go in there and you go, bloop, and there it is. Your clutter's gone, and then this is the sequence. This is just a pure clutter sequence, so what we're left with now is the noise floor of the radar. And so that's what, that's, I mean, it looks good, and it is good, and it works well, without a doubt. It works well, without a doubt. And so I'm going to use these red arrows to indicate, you know, what's going on here with these skirts that are on that first raw spectrum. Okay, and I guess you could see that bottom, this velocity Doppler spectrum, plus or minus about 13 meters per second, and the vertical scale is in dB. And so, and then once you do this windowing function, you, uh, you know, you get rid of that skirts. And, and so wh- wh- where do those skirts come from? What's causing that? And if we can understand that, maybe we can think about another way of clutter filtering. So the, the reason those guys are there is simply a function of the discrete Fourier transform. And we use an FFT, of course, to implement the discrete Fourier transform. And, but what's critical to understand is that the, it turns a finite length t- time series that we have to work with into a repeating function, infinitely repeating. That's the nature of sinusoids. And all I've done down here is put down the well-known um, Fourier transform pair and so there's the frequency domain, and there's how you do the transform. There's the time domain, and you simply represent that time domain signal as a sum of these, of these sinusoids. And because that's a sinusoid, it causes, these, these, um, causes your time domain signal to be repeating. So here's a real clutter signal over on the left-hand side. And then so we've got this clutter signal, and we're going to have to represent it now somehow with these basis function, real and imaginary parts. And so we have DC, or a constant, and then here's the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, and such. And so you need to represent that. And so you can see that that, that clutter signal doesn't really look like any of these basis functions because it doesn't land on one of the basis functions. And, and therein lies the, uh, lies the problem or what happens with those skirts. Another way to look at it is that here is that here is when you take a sum of sinusoids, what have you actually done? Well, you've created this repeating sequence. And shown with these blue dotted lines is this large jump. Once you go through that series, it starts over again. And if you're going to take a sum of sinusoids such that you create this, these discontinuities here, you need a lot of high frequency content. And that's how come you have that, those skirts on there. And so, what's the way around that? See, and that's, I just, I should have hit that button, but that's just what I said. And so the way around that is to take these time series and you window it. Right now, there, there is a handing window applied to that data, and you can see what happened at those dotted blue lines. There, there is no discontinuity there anymore. 
and therefore you've gotten, you'll get rid of all that high frequency content. So I don't know how familiar everybody is is Windows and the frequency domain, but here is a uh, a set of the set of these windows. Can you see the uh, the Han and the Blackman? Those are two very popular ones. I believe the um, the red one is the Han. So you can see you know the, the the effect that it has on the time series signal. And then here are the frequency domain. Uh, equivalents of what these look like if you take an FFT of those windows and so that you can and, and this tells you what it does to the to the true underlying true whatever that may be the true underlying spectra gets convolved with um, with these functions here and that's what your output spectrum will look like but uh, it's important to see here that this blue one is for a rectangular window and then as you increase the aggressiveness, the attenuation of these things, this main lobe gets wider and wider, and that means that this uh, uh, signal that you're interested in gets spread in the frequency domain more and more. So that's an important concept. Okay, so the window effect on spectra, go through that one more time here. So there, there are these two types of spectra. This one is handing windowed on the right. There is the raw spectrum on the left. You can see the difference in the noise floor. And then you identify that and you notch it out. But is, it, but is there another way to, that we can take a look at that? And that's a, that's a real clutter signal there. I think I've got another, another picture of it up there. So, but I, I, you don't see clutter signals like that too, too much over, uh, over a two-second period. So there are many radar dwells there, and, but if you concatenated them all, that, that's actually S-Pole scanning the, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Okay, well, well, the answer to that question is yes, or Yoda and you folks wouldn't be here today. So let's take a look at uh, regression filtering. And so here again is that typical clutter signal. And on those red dotted lines over there, that's about a radar dwell. And that's what, what we see. That's how that clutter signal will be broken up into these individual blocks that we're going to try to deal with with our, with our filtering al algorithm. So there's the I, the real, the Q, and the, and the imaginary. And so the idea here is that you can see that signal is very slowly varying. So here's another actual signal from S-Pole with a slow varying signal. You can see that with your eye. And then there's that high varying signal. That's a weather echo. And so obviously, well, maybe not so obviously, but if you want to go ahead and do some kind of a regression fit on that, it maps the, uh, the mean of that signal that slow varying portion, and then once you have that, you simply subtract it, and there's your weather echo. It, it, it's quite nice. It's just very, it's so simple. It's really simple, I know, but uh, people don't do it. Okay, regression clutter filtering. They have a, uh, a pretty big history in the biomedical field where they're used a lot. There's a number of papers. This is probably one of the earlier ones there in the IEEE transactions. And it actually was looked at by uh, Tories and Zernick down in Norman. And, they, and there's a 99 paper called Ground Clutter Cancellation with a Regression Filter. But remember, this is about the time that GMAP started to come around. And so for whatever reason, they looked at that, and then they saw GMAP, and they decided to go with GMAP. And it was abandoned. Okay, just to give you a brief, I didn't want to throw equations here, but a little bit you should understand. Here is the representation of your signal here as, a, as these coefficients and these polynomials, the P sub J's. And so when you do a poly regression fit, you've got to determine what these alphas are. You typically put it into a, a matrix form like this, and then you can express it as a matrix equation down here. And then to get the alphas, there's this matrix inversion. And these matrix inversions a lot of time are, are problematic because if the determinant is close to zero, they blow up and, uh, and they, be they can become unstable. But the trick here is that this is way back in 1957. Look at that. So this is nothing new here. There's this guy, uh, Forsyth, that uh, came up with a set of orthogonal polynomials that would force all of those off-diagonal terms of P-transpose P to zero. And so once you do that, if you go through the mathematics, these alphas can be found by simple summations. No matrix inversion. It's cool. 
very cool. And, and he also can be shown that the polynomials are actually obey this recursive relationship. So you go through and you recursively find the next order and the next order, the next order. And this is a big deal because there is, is this, it makes a very fast algorithm and it has very low uh, round-off error. And if you go to this guy, this old French guy here, he has a signal processing page, and he has that foresight regression polynomial fitting routine in C or in Fortran, and you can grab it. Now, you may think that this is not a big deal, but we looked at this regression filtering way back in 2009, and we found that, uh, I found, I just grabbed the first thing, I could do that, that matrix inversion. And so... Um, um, once you get up to about order nine, you could see that it was there was um, um, there, the error started to get to, it and and it was it wasn't convergent anymore, and and the, and, the, and the fitting was very very poor. So we kind of abandoned it too, that along with no funding to pursue it. So there's two things that make science go forward, and so here you see these are these Forsyth polynomials. A is the is a constant, and there's a straight line, and so these are the orthogonal polynomials now that you know that are projected onto your function, or your function's projected on that, and you can you can um, uh, you know represent your func your your signal as a you know, summation of these various uh, these various polynomials. Okay, so regression filtering. So here's another example. I'll get a, little, a little more detail here. But there's the real part, the imaginary part. The dotted line is a fit there again. And then here are the residuals, the real residuals and the imaginary residual. In other words, after you subtract off the fit. So, and then here's what the, um, uh, the resulting spectra looks like. And, and for, I chose this one because there's actually a little bit of weather that's underneath there. And that was an eighth order fit. And there was the raw spectrum. I mean, no, really no sign of that from the raw spectrum, right? But there was the, there's that weather signal that was underneath there. Okay, and so let's try the GMAP technique on that. So there is a black moon window, that spectrum. And you see that that weather signal now does show up. And then you can go in there and you can do your notch and, and it looks really similar, doesn't it? So why would we want to go with regression filtering? Good question. Your weather is less than a notch. You should know. This is a quiz. Well, how do you know it's weather there? Oh, from looking at the data. You know, uh, uh, from the PPI data, you can't tell much looking at a spectrum, but you have the, you have the, you know, the overall. You have the radar data you can look at. We also have this. You should read. We have this thing called CMD, and uh, it has a pretty good job at telling you what's clutter and where's weather there. What's the rest of it here? Noise. Yeah, that typically down there is is the noise floor. Yep, yep, yep. Well. The answer is, whoops, there's, there's a comparison again here between the, um, the regression filtered spectra and I should have put this in the notch filtered. So again, they look, they, look pretty, they look pretty equivalent. So why do that? And of course the answer is... What would is, clear air look like? Could you tell? Uh, clear air would look like noise. I mean, just pure without clutter? Yeah. No, it no, just looked like noise. No, looked like a random signal. Around. Well, if you have clutter in there, I showed one of those before. Once you, the first one that I showed you, that was that was basically in clear air. We can go back and look at that, but it just once you, you show if there's any velocity, it should show uh, the speed of the wind. Clear. Air. You gotta have you gotta have some scatterers, or else yeah, it ain't gonna show you nothing. Well, I think some of these were taken in the winter time, but the, for whatever reason. There weren't any echo in that, <laughs> that first echo. Of course, it, of course, it'll show you anything out there that, that's a scatter. It'll show up in your spectrum, without a doubt. Without a doubt. So anyways, the regression window versus the... They seem similar, so what's the difference? Why well, use a regression filter? And it's the signal statistics. The Blackman window knocks your signal down by 5.23 d... 2, 3 dB attenuation for 64-point sequence. And this it, it kills you, your, if your variance, by about 50%. Increases your variance of, of your estimating those, under, those signals underneath. And a handing window offers about 4.19 dB attenuation. And that's about, a th and it's just going to be different for different lengths and for, for um, uh, you know, the different variables and whatnot. But this is, you know. Variance of what? Uh, Z, velocity, 
uh, 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 you know, FDP, et cetera. I'll, anything you estimate, anything you estimate. And, and of course, why does that happen? There's my second quiz. You flunked the first question. Now who can get this one? Well, it, it uh, kills the number of independent samples you have. And once you reduce the number of independent samples, your statistics have got to go up. So that's, so that's what's going on there. Okay, well, there are those uh, windows again, and so you can see, that, whoops, I went forward and I didn't want to. You can see over here now, that, that you can, here's that red curve, this black one's very popular, and you can see, I mean, you drive this stuff down to zero. Out here, you're just throwing away samples, out here and out here, and for, uh, for, a 64, for 64 milliseconds, you only get like about, you know, five or six independent samples at the most, and so if you start throwing away signals, you start throwing away information. So this, this, visually, this window and notch technique is nice, but you're, you're, just, you're killing any weather signal that's underneath. So let's go on and take a little more look at these regression filters. And the best way to look at a filter is what it does in the spectrum domain. And uh, these are, this is uh, for 64 points. And this is uh, 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 um, the frequency response for different orders, 3, 5, looks like I go to 19 at steps of 2. Uh, thank Ricky here. Ricky came up with these plots for me. Um, there's the attenuation in dB. And this is just a zoomed in you know, view at this guy because you can't see him. But it's kind of interesting, this uh, little ripply guy. And all these circles are at the um, discrete points. On there, so we we went ahead and we were able to you know, plot in between the points. You get this kind of interesting, ripply thing, and I'm not quite sure why that should be there, but it, but it sure is. And uh, so that it, I mean, so if you're thinking about using this, you can see by choosing your regression order, you can control your bandwidth, and of course that's what you like to do: control your bandwidth. You want to get rid of more signal, you want to get less signal, etc. Okay, so you can do it for every different sequence, how many points you're going to be using, these, these things change. I'm sorry they didn't say that this was, uh, you know, this was plus minus pi, that's radian, radian talk. And, uh, you know, down here we're going from just minus pi by two to zero, so you're just zoomed in. So you can do that for your various sequences. Um, I, I did this one just mainly for myself so I could look more closely at these higher orders and what's going on with them. So there they go. You can do it for 40 points. You can do it for any, 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 any sequence that you want. Well, how do, we, how do we create these things? You can do it from the mathematics, uh, but I kind of like doing it this way. And so you take and you generate white noise. You know, you can take a filter and, and put, shove white noise through it and find out what the frequency response is. Engineers out there will probably appreciate this. Uh, you do a polynomial fit. Of course, you subtract off the polynomial fit. You zero pad it because that's the zero padding on the sequence which gives you that resolution to see those waves in there. So you zero pad it, um, and then you do the FFT, and you calculate the spectrum, and then you average with the previous one, and you could put some kind of convergence here or something like that. I just put in a big number. Ricky put in a big number. Thank you. And uh, you just keep doing this, and we, I think we did this for 100,000 iterations, right, because computers are, don't care how much they work. And, uh, and that's how I generated those plots. But you can you can look at the uh, uh, you know at the mathematics and do it that way. Okay, so this is, it works really well for these um, however large you'd like to call a 64 point sequence and less. But longer sequences may may require higher order filters. And, and can these sequences can be uh, uh, effectively filtered? Well, you can go ahead and do tricks with this stuff. So that here is a standard How many tech. Points are we usually using? In, uh, in operational or in our research radars? We normally use about uh, 64 to 128 because we like to scan slow and get a, quite a few samples. And next rad, you go from, I think they have even eight samples up to, I think, over 100 samples for different VCPs. You're applying this to INQ independently? Yes, correct. Correct. 
Okay, so there's our 64-point time series. But what you can do is you can break this stuff up in blocks. You, you can see it's just a, you're, trying to, you're trying to eliminate that mean trend, and so you can block, put them up into blocks here. I, if it were 64, there would be four 16-point 16, 16 blocks, and then you could do regression fits to each one of them and then concatenate that data and go ahead with your calculations. There are some drawbacks to that, and I'll get to that. Um, another way you can do this is to actually overlap, and, and it turns out if you want to get a clean-looking spectrum, you need to overlap these guys, and in these points of overlap, you know, you would, you would wait one more toward the interior, point one, the one on the end of this one, a uh, 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 point the other way around, the one in the, one in the interior, 0 0.9, and the one that's on the end, 0 0.1, and you could average them together in this fashion. It would, help, it would help smooth any little transitions that may be going from one block to another block. Um, so that's another way you can, you can do that to work for. Or you may want to have uh, a more aggressive filter, and it's easier to get a more aggressive filter if you have shorter sequences and you don't require such large uh, polynomial fits. So that's a way to do that. So um, issue with contiguous blocks, so, so here is, again, here's another Doppler spectrum, uh, plus minus uh, about, about 13 meters per second. This, this is the raw spectrum, and I did 11th order fit here. So there's the notch. And then if you just take four contiguous blocks, what you will see, and you apply like a third order filter to the, each, of, each of those blocks, what you will see is you get this annoying behavior a lot of times not all the time but a lot of times and this even though it's you know it's fairly far down compared maybe to your signal it is uh that doesn't bode well does it but if you do this uh five block overlap is the error in velocity because of that yeah that's a very good question yeah, so it's, it's, it's going to depend. It's, it, there's so many different variables. It depends if there actually was a signal down in this noise that you wanted to, to extrapolate. But I've, I've, all, I've done that. The signal's up here at around um, well, this, meters per second, right? Yeah, back here, that's correct. So it probably wouldn't. That's right, it's a good point. That probably wouldn't affect that velocity estimate well, very much. Know. But I, I've, I've done that also. I've taken a look at rays of data and used these various filters and taken a look at the, uh, at the, at the variance you know, of the fields as you, as you go along in time. But obviously this is not a, this is not a good thing to have, and this, is, this would argue for using a, uh, uh, doing this overlap business. Because I know you're all going to want to run out and use this filter, and I'm suggesting that you look at, the, you take a look at that. Okay, so here's S. What am I doing here? Here's the uh, S pole clutter environment. That's this is all clutter that's out there. It was, it was uh, uh, basically a clear day, and we're going to use this data set, you know, specifically looking at these nice mountains that are close by, to go ahead and compare the regression in this what I call GMAP like filters, and so. Uh, I put this back up here because I, what I'm going to compare here for these particular set of plots is a seventh order regression, which is this light blue line, to a seven point notch. And that's represented by these dotted lines. You can't see there's so many damn curves here. And so, and so you can see that they are somewhat similar. However, it, with a seven point notch, this frequency component would be zeroed out but with the um, regression filter, this one only gets attenuated, you know, maybe three and a half dB in that area. Okay, let's compare them and take a look. Oh, so I'll, you can t t instead of just looking at a, at a curves like that, you can go here is the seventh order uh, filter. Here is the these are just the um, uh, the points on the frequency response. This is the middle point. That's the zero velocity point. Okay, and then and this these numbers are are how much they're going to be attenuated now. And I just the ones in yellow were were, were three dB and greater, so that you could kind of see. A lot of times, electrical engineers we like to work with three dB point a lot of times. And so there's the uh, uh, the seventh order regression and the attenuations that will be applied to the signal, as compared to that seven point notch. Okay, I think we have a big picture coming is up that, here. Is that a number, an absolute number, or dB, or what? dB. Uh, th this those is, numbers? those, I'm, I didn't label that, doggone it. 
and those are attenuations in dB, sorry. With a, a filter, you know, if you hadn't, every, if it passed, it would be zero dB. So that is 299 dB at zero velocity. Yeah, it kind of kills the signal there. That, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should I put just, I, I guess I could have limited that to 100. That's just what came out of these computers. These computers will give you anything, you know. <laughs> Ricky, can you f fix that for me? Oh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's here's some uh, comparisons now. There's a lot going on in this in this figure. I may well maybe I can stand here. And here's the seventh order regression. And so let's so here we have uh, the unfiltered power of these time series that are are pouring into this filter. And then this is the power after it was regression filtered. These things are in dB, and they're just the I and Q values as they come off. And I don't try to calibrate it or anything. I just I squared plus Q squared, and that's power in, in dB. There are no units to it. Um, so here you go. So you, you, you can so starting off with the lowest level signals. Maybe this is a good way to go because this is around the noise floor of this radar is about minus seventy five dB in this scale, and so finally up here you start some of this uh, this this clutter. I'll, let me say one more thing about the all these points were uh, filtered with this this term called CPA. CPA is clutter phase alignment. It's, a, it's something that goes into the uh, clutter identification routine we have. And basically, at, at point nine, it will throw out all of the rubbish data in there. So these are pretty solid clutter points only that are allowed through this. So we don't get bogged down with a bunch of, of you know, nasty contaminated data that may have birds or it could have cars or airplanes or movement in there for whatever reason. We don't want to get sidetracked by that stuff. Okay, so uh, so you can see here that uh, uh, as this power goes in and it's filtered, it's it's you get rid of the clutter and you remain at the noise floor. So you just knock it back down to the noise floor. This clutter, so the power goes. And there's always going to be some of these outliers. There's some. There's always can be some stuff out there in the wings of your spectra, and then and so I'm, I'm calling that the um, uh, uh, the noise floor. It goes up here, and you pretty much track that noise floor up to a point where the power returned uh, has enough coming off from your transmit signal that the noise floor of the transmit signal the, from the from the klystron and the transmitter, you know, and that that noise floor there, you only get you get only so much clearance from the peak of your transmit to the noise floor, okay? And so you enter this thing up here with. Uh, what, what do I call the linear range that's marked in purple? So that as as the uh, input power increases, the noise floor also increases, and when you eliminate the clutter, you're hanging out at the noise floor here. What's left over? Finally, when the power gets great enough, you start getting l these nonlinear effects. You get into saturation. This this noise can be spread, or, or the power can get spread around, and so therefore, you know, I got that blue thing there called the. Uh, Call it, you know, that, that's caused by receiver saturation, I believe. Um, and all of these red points are just outliers from whatever spurious signals that might be out there. Okay, what else can I say about this lovely plot? Um, and then I stuck these lines on here so that, you know, it indicates a a vertical and horizontal axes location, and then I put a 45 degree red line through there that kind of intersects the, the uh, those those highest points there. And so you can see that the best you can do with this filter for this data set is about 60 dB rejection of the of the clutter signal. There's, oh, here we go. There's 10,000 points in this thing. So, and the seven point Blackman, you see, it it behaves you know quite similarly. And it has about 60 dB regression. And so uh, I was told so by these... what is the signal actually here? I, I'm what is the signal? It's a clutter... What, I mean, what power unfiltered, what is that? Is that a radar signal? There are the signals right there. We're scanning across the Rocky Mountains, and we are picking up... You know, I start about, I don't want to get out here. I, I think I limited myself to just across the up and down the Rocky Mountain. So it's all of these, uh, all of these powers. It's all these spectra that have little tent-like features okay, to them. So all the, all the bright signals are probably ground color. Quite I would say that, you know, 90, 
eight percent of that is ground clutter. It was a clear looks day. Like maybe clear air. There, there may be some stuff in there. Let's see. Um, Four twenty-two. So probably there can be some bugs up in the air by, by the middle of uh, by the middle of April. Mm -hmm. I mean, I should have put the velocity up there, and then you would have been more convinced, I suppose, that that is, that is actually a, a majority ground clutter. But it is. But you're also filtering out a lot of this. Uh, clear air. Yeah, that's air right. Air I, that's that CPA. precisely. So there is some. There's always going to be gunk in your uh, in your in your targets out there, and so we want to. We're, we're check. We, what we want to do is, is compare these things against you know good hard clutter targets and see what the regression filter can do to them, and see what the um, the window and notch can do to them. So, and I think this is a pretty good representation of it. I mean, it's, I mean, there's so many different aspects to be shown on this stuff. It's, it's difficult to show everything. Okay, there we go. So there's another way to go ahead and compare that rather than looking at it. it, it, it this gives you a certain amount of information that's, that's interesting to look at. But then you all... identical. Yeah, they are. Th that, and that was the whole point because I... I would, from construct from uh, um, conversations with NSSL, they they didn't think I could achieve the same amount of uh, suppression. Nobody knew if how much suppression oh. that you could get. Right. So you got to like and look at this filter. And if I'm going to try to get them to put that on next rat, I got to show that hey, you get as much suppression as you can out of GMAP using this thing. So that's a very important thing to show. Oh, oops! I went by this thing. See, I'm taking longer on these. Um, Plots than I thought, so I'll just have to have part two of this seminar. Mm. <laughs> okay. All right, so what we can do, maybe a better way to look at this, or it gives you different information, is so here is the power filtered with a Blackman in the window, 7-point notch. You get rid of the clutter power, and then you calculate whatever power remains in your signal that's left over, and then you can use a seventh order regression filter, the same deal, and then you just plot them against each other. And the red line there is a one-to-one -one line, and so you can see you, it's very, very similar. As Bob would say, I don't see much difference. Um, the, the yellow line's standard deviation and 95% confidence interval. I don't, not really so much information, but I left them in there. But on all of these plots, you see these outliers, and these outliers are always on the side of the regression filter. In other words, the regression filter somehow doesn't, there's some small percentage of these things where the regression filter doesn't knock down the noise, doesn't knock it down. And so the question is, why the heck is that? Here's my third quiz. <laughs> anybody, anybody, anybody can have that answer. Well. And then Greg noticed this also. Greg said, you know, a lot of times I don't see that this uh, noise is being knocked down the noise floor as, as compared to the GMAP filter. So here, uh, one of those things that I circled here, one of those outlier cases, one of those dots. There is, there is one of those signals, okay, it looks just the same. You go ahead and you window it, it looks just the same, right? You know, here is that big chunk of clutter. You can notch it out. There is the noise floor there. And then you can regression filter that, and there's a noise floor there. There, that's down at 45 dB. That's more like up around, you know, 58, 57. There is a little bit of a cheat on the other one because I don't believe I corrected it for that 5.23 dB. That was like what? The noise floor is lower here than here. L lower where? In the notch. Absolutely, it is. And that's the question: Why is it lower? A lot of those other plots. Maybe because it's better. You doubt me. <laughs> okay, well, let's go. Minus so let's go. I wonder what that's causing there. Any, has anybody got an idea? It's, it's very you interesting. You have a rectangle window on your data, so you have a sink filter in there. Sink filter, yeah. And what is that sink filter doing, you think? Go back to your, one of your first plots where you had all the window functions. You yeah. still have a rectangle sitting on top yeah. of this. You may be yeah. paying the price for more independent samples. Well, none of those are correct. Sorry. 
Let's move on. So here you go. Here is the real. So you got to look at the time series. Sometimes you don't look at the spectra. The spectra can be a little bit misleading or baffling. So here is the time series data. There is the real in the imaginary parts in the top and the bottom row. Okay, let's move over here. Here are the residuals. Okay, you can see, and this is for the windowed and notched function. So you can see the effects of that window here on the right and the left-hand side where you just knock down the signal. Okay, and then there's the real and imaginary. And here is what happens with the regression. So you hear the residual there, and look, at, look, what, look what's going on out here. And this is significantly, I think about a factor of five, above where all the rest of the signal is. And, and why don't we see it over here? It's been windowed out. You attenuated the crap out of that signal. Okay, and so, and what does an impulse function look like in the time domain? Flat. It looks like Almost noise. In the time domain or in spectral? In the spectral domain. Well, it's a delta function. Yeah. Is, is this that little? Yeah, you can't even hardly see it. There's just a little, a little, a little bit of a little, time, but a little, little ticky wicky up there. That's what it is. That's what it is. I mean, you don't see it there because it's, it's such, such a small. Remember, we're, we're we're looking at clutter rejection things of 60 dB, 50 dB. You know, one part and was that 10,000 for 60 dB? That's a pretty small part <laughs> part of your signal, right? So, so anyways, on all of those things. And I didn't look at them all because there's many of them. But every one that I looked at, they all have these, what I'll just call like a delta function in the time domain. And a delta function in the time domain translates to, you know, just white noise in the spectral domain. And indeed, the, uh, 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 the filtered spectra here was about 4 dB lower than the, than the filtered uh, um, signal here. But it's all, it all comes through. Now, if, if that, if this, if this signal had been in the middle of the time series, it would affect the Blackman window as much as it would affect the, um, uh, the regression filter. But then they would compare, and you wouldn't see a difference, and that's how come you never see a difference, you know, when you compare what them that way. Is with the signal in the middle of the time, the signal is continuous. So we're just dealing here with a finite, real f finite time series. So what I'm saying, Bob, is that if this little wiggly glitch had been in here, it would not have been attenuated by the window function. And it would affect the, the window and notch filter as much as it would the regression filter. And you won't see any difference. By a higher order polynomial. Well, you know, if you go high enough, you 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 fit it, you fill, you fit everything, right? But I didn't, I didn't feel that that was productive. So anyway, it is. It's, it's really interesting. And Mike tells me he can write up an algorithm. We'll go in there. We'll identify these outliers, and then we can can weed them out and, and improve our statistics. In our, and that's another way to improve statistics here that we're talking about it. But that's pretty cool, I thought. That's pretty interesting. Okay, um, the other thing we have to worry about now before we talk about replacing GMAP is that we, how much time do I have here to put you people to sleep? Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Better wrap it up. Okay. Um, is that it can, this notch, you know, shown here with the, here, so here's a raw spectrum. I hope you're getting used to this now. And there is the, I use this slide somewhere else, and there is the um, the, the window uh, spectra, and there is a notch I just put in there. I picked a five point notch. It doesn't look like we caught all the signal there, does it? But this but this notch is adapted to the spectrum, and so it can be made wider or narrower depending upon the strength of your clutter signal. And so far yet, I haven't talked about that in terms of the regression filter. Well, so there's a number of ways we can look down into the details more. Here's another, here's another picture from, uh, here we go, we have the bomb cyclone here on, uh, on uh, 13th March. Okay, and here again, it's obvious where the Rocky Mountains are, and we have some, in, some of that clutter is embedded in the weather. And this is what we call, this is our GMAP-like filter, a window and notch, and this is how, what this looks like, and you can see the Rocky Mountains are knocked down a lot, but they're not eliminated here. But this is much like the, the GMAP. How far down are they? 
Bob, you ask hard questions here. So they, they, we probably, we, we get it down. Uh, uh, see what this is a more recent one. We're working pretty well. We should be able to knock a lot of that stuff down. You know, 50, 55 dB, some of it, but a lot of it can be higher than that, just depending upon what's left. I'll guarantee you, you got rid of any, the, 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 the clutter signal that's around zero velocity. But sometimes that, that, that there can be artifacts, you know, in these spectra. And you're not going to eliminate them with a regression filter nor with a GMAP filter unless you just, if you, if you make that notch wide enough, you always can get very, very good clutter suppression. You won't have any signal left. But, <laughs> it's, okay. It's like 50 some dBZ here, right? Yeah, I can come up with that number there. I mean, and over you, here, it's around, I don't know, 18. It, 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 th that information was contained in, the, in the, the, that uh, arch, arc shaped plot in there. So there, there's a variety of suppression levels depending upon the clutter. But what we want to do here is what we want to compare the G mappy type thing to a regression filter. So Mike wrote this up, and so we're going to regression filter it now. So there's a fifth order filter. That's not bad, huh? Fifth order gets it, knocks it down. Next door to it is a seventh order filter. And if you take a look at the mountains in particular, it does a particularly nice job here on reducing that clutter sum. And this, whereas Mike's filter here, that is applied only where the clutter is. That should be correct. Mike, tell me if I'm, in, if I'm wrong. And then uh, here, our fifth and seventh order, because we haven't really completely implemented yet, is just applied everywhere so we can take a look at the effects of the clutter filter. And so then let's step it up one more time. There's the regression nine everywhere. And I'll take a look at the regression nine over in the mountains. And here are the mountains after a GMAP-like filter. So what, what this tells me, and I'm not necessarily advocating a regression of nine in particular, but it shows me that indeed with a proper regression filter selected, you can do just as good, if not better, than a GMAP-type filter. So, you know, staring at these types of images gives you an idea of what regression order you should use. Another way you can kind of figure this off, and I don't want to go through all the uh, deep. So far, I haven't seen how it would affect real weather signals. Uh, what do you mean? How it would affect? Variables, velocities, reflectivity factors, etc. You're going to make my talk go another 10 minutes because that's farther down into the slides, but I do that also. But John, we need to see clearer. We need to see, you know, stuff that's zero dBZ. What do you mean? See what what does it do to it? What does? What? what wait a second. When you put these 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 filters on, what happens to the weather? I mean, the clear air weather. It'll air be air. there. Huh? I mean, as long as it's, if it's away from zero velocity, it'll be there just like it's there with the GMAP filter. Yeah, but some of it's zero. It's very close. Well, we have this thing again apparently you keep forgetting about, called CMD. And we're not going to filter where there's zero, zero velocity and it's weather. Now, if you want to go to the case where um, it's, you know, very narrow spectrum width weather along the zero velocity isodop, nobody can, you know, tell the difference but between that. We were, this is like being at a next round attack meeting. Well, the no, first thing we say to you is, show me all kinds of different weather situations. Show me clear air situations. Well, this is not a tack, first of all. <laughs> but, Second of all, this is hopefully for people that might want to go and understand the filter and go apply it. So it has a very definite engineering twang to it. Mm -hmm. But I do go ahead and show, and I, we have done that, applied this regression filter as we have here, to, uh, and, and then we can identify you know, clear air. Hopefully Mike will go ahead and then take CMD and use that data, and then only apply the regression filter to where we, and so we can make better, better comparisons at, John, at that point. Displays, that, so? that is correct. Why is it red on one side and green on the other? Well, let's see. This is down here. This says this is kind of low level. This is probably a stratiform case somewhere. Extensive precipitation across this whole environment at around, you know, 21, 24 dB. Over here, here we have the mountains, and there's no, it's been blocked anyway, so you're not going to see anything so, so there. 
It's blocked there, less so maybe down here, but I would say that like many of these storms, that is probably upslope, I can check that. All the weather's out here and there's no weather out there. And so that's just green, you're down there. You know, that's the noise one. Elevation angle is 0.477. Probably not accurate to that. So there's DIA and there's KFTG. Streak there in both, and even in the uh, right here. No, no. Blue streak, uh, blue streak. Yeah, this long blue streak, uh, just to the right of the radar, almost north south. Oh, right here. I think those yeah, are county lines, aren't they? The these are that? these are county lines, right? Mike, you no, put those no, on. No, no, no. Not, not this blue streak. Oh, no. Okay, another one. See the LMS pole. You're talking about right here. Yes, it, it's, it goes right up and down. Um, you, 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 this this kind of nebulous read. There's not really a line, just this edge of the echo. You mean? Well, it might be the edge of the echo. But yeah, that's that's what it is. It's just the edge of that. Yeah, it's the edge of the echo. I think so. Yeah. I wonder why it's there. Well, the weather comes in various shapes. And if you have a slope, why would it die closer to the mountains? Well, just because it's close to the well, radar. Maybe it's getting stronger. <laughs> I don't think I don't think so. I, I just that's just the weather that's out there. So um, we have a few minutes left, so maybe we could uh, let John finish his talk and then maybe. We'll <laughs> <have some questions. laughs> no, I'll stay here for another hour. If people want to ask questions. I, I enjoy this. That's good because it helps my research yeah, and so makes me think we about. Could, we could see, save them for after. Yeah, we yeah absolutely yeah. I mean, we can, we can, there's a lot of things to ask questions about here. Um, should we continue on, I guess? So there, so this, so this is just what I went through to, you know, to try to come up with some kind. Remember, what I'm trying to do here now is to come up with a way to adjust the regression order to what's really out there so we don't over filter things and we filter enough on other things. And so then I've done a lot of plots like this that show the unfiltered power. Here again, this is the power that's the signal coming into your filter, and there is what's left over the filtered power. Not, not all of these graphs, but you can see from each one of them there are different different power levels. And if you take a close look at them here, there's here's a reg different regression orders. There's different window and notch functions, um, and for, for all of them there. And I I don't want to take because I don't think it's so interesting. But you know, so you, you do all this type of work, and then I went ahead and decided that well, it seemed to me that for 0 to 10 dB input, about a ninth order filter would work well to knock out the mountains. And then from minus 25 to 0 dB, a seventh order filter would be sufficient. And then down lower yet, you know, sixth order, and then below 45, fifth order, and you might even be able to, you know, reduce this even more when you're down down here to like maybe a, a fourth. I use a lot of odd orders here, but there's nothing magic about these even in odd orders. You can use any order that seems to work. And so what I'm showing here is, is I've adjusted the regression fit according to how much power is there. And then you can see here is the resulting scatter plot. And it looks very similar to just taking a seventh order regression and applying it everywhere. You should see a little bit better performance up here because I'm using a ninth order over there. But so in, in general, this was just to, to prove that this technique of, of, of trying to. So, but how do we find out what the um, what the power is? And so this is a very interesting thing here. Um, one way to, to find out how much generally how much clutter power there is, you take a DFT of the signal and take a look at zero velocity plus the next two velocity points. Right, just those interior points, and so this is a scatter plot now of the of the power of those three central velocities, okay, versus the total power in the signal, and so that this is just from that same S pole diagram with no weather, just clutter, and you can see there's a pretty good one to one correspondence. So if I can do a DFT and calculate uh, the power from those three central velocities, I got a pretty good estimate of how much clutter is around. Another way to do it, though. Is with, remember I said about these uh, Forsyth polynomials is that they're regressively defined. So as you use that regression formula, you automatically are going to have a second order fit, and then you take that second order fit, and that's going to be a very narrow 
bandwidth to the thing. And you can see how much power is knocked out by that second order fit. And here is the power of the second order regression. That's the power that's um, knocked out by the filter. And there, here is the power from the three central velocities. And you, it works pretty well. And so you don't have to do the DFT. You don't have to window it and do a DFT. That's a lot of extra calculations. You're gonna, you can just do it with a regression filter. So you can save a lot of time doing it that way. So this, this is something that uh, I think is really cool also. Um, how do geez. You, how do, I mean, hate to ask another question. You're making this fun, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what is the ratio of um, computational power? using the, let's say, ninth order regression versus the traditional uh, Fourier transform. It's pretty efficient in the way it calculates that. I'm going to rely upon my software engineering force that I have in here with Mike and uh, Greg. I mean, I, I think there, there's plenty enough time to do this in real time if that was the end point no, of your I'm question. I'm wondering if there is you know, an advantage of one over the other regarding Oh, the, the DFT to this regression thing? Well, I mean, you're going to have to do the regression anyway. So it's there. Why not use it? Whereas the DFT would be an additional step. You know, and that takes up a little bit of time to run that DFT to just figure out the power at those three central velocities. Well, what do you think, Ricky? Should I wind it up here? I got more slides. What time is it anyway? It is 4.30. It's 4, holy, 4.27. 4, so maybe in terms for the filming and whatnot, we can uh, wind it up. But I have more slides and we'll entertain as many questions as people want to fire up. Do you show real data? Well, I just did show you some real yeah, data there. What, how, what's, yeah. how real does it have to get? But that's all you have is those you showed. I have other ones. I've showed you a lot. That's what all I want to see. <laughs> John, you Let, mentioned the adaptability. To what extent is the regressive scheme adaptable the way the spectral analysis is? Well, it's completely different. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not really in, in that sense um, because you don't, look, you don't need to go into the frequency domain. You can go into the frequency domain and once you're in the frequency domain, you can do the same thing as you would do with a, with a GMAP thing, and you can tinker with, the, um, with, with your components in the frequency domain. And you can do, in fact, I've got that in a slide buried down in there. I call it frequency compensation because with, with, the, um, with those regression filters, it's just not chunk, chunk. They have a little bit of a taper on them before it really crashes in. And there is some signal attenuated in here that you may want to take and boost your signal back up to get rid of any Z bias that you might have when you're using a regression filter. <clears throat> I don't know if that answered your question or not, but... No. We have another question. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, had a, you had a question? So, uh, you called these Forsyth polynomials. I did. Yeah. So, I know of, like, a savitsky galay uh, filter. Is this the same thing? How is it different? Um, well, see, there are some, there are some line are, plots that I can show you, Bob, of the different effect that these, these filters have on real data in terms of ray plots. But I wanted to entertain this other... other qu Look, it's magic. It's with the clay. It's right there. Who, who would have thunk? Who would have thunk it? What's that? Okay, I'll tell you. Okay, so there, this, and, and this is what's going on. It's a good question because this is what they used back in NSSL. Tories and uh, Zernick, they use a Savitsky Golay technique. If you look at one of their internal reports, they describe it. And so, with Savitsky Golay, what do you do? You actually have a, um, and I think Scott's group use a lot of the stuff, don't you? And so, if I get this wrong, let me know or tell me afterwards to embarrass me, okay? Um, and so if you have a 64-point sequence and you're going to use a, 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 a core of uh, a kernel of 16 points, you'd start off over here and you do a, a polynomial fit on the first 16 points and then you would, you, know, you would keep the first eight points. 
and then you would progress forward a point, and then you would do another polynomial fit, and then you would keep the center point. And then you'd progress forward and do another polynomial fit, and you would use the center point. And you would progress across the, across the whole uh, sequence until you got to the end, and then you'd do another polynomial fit on those last 16 points, and you would keep those, those remaining eight points. Did I do it right? Good. So that's... So that's the, the polynomials in each case. Polynomial fit. They're each polynomials. It's see, savitsky kille is just a you, you work out the least square solution to a polynomial fit. That's right. Is polynomials the same. Oh, plus oh, I mean a zero plus a one but, but, plus a two x. They, they're just they're all just polynomials, but it's how that how you. It's how they're, that's right. And so the only thing that Forsyth did, and it's a big, it's a big deal, is that he chose, and rather just going, you're going to do the x squared, and then we're going to work on x cubed, then we're going to work on x fourth. He has a, he has these polynomials set up to, that they're orthogonal to each other. Polynomials are, are orthogonal. I don't, no, no, they're not. No. Mm -mm. They're, you can make that's, them orthogonal. That's what, that's what I meant. But they're not orthog. These are actually orthonormal. You're creating an orthonormal Ortho basis. They're you interproduct one with the other, and you get zero. Whereas if you interproduct one and x, you don't get zero. So the, as you said, the matrix is diagonal. Yep, and that's and that's the key there. And it's a cool formulation with, with that recursive nature of how he defines well, at it. At the end of the day, it's you're just you can do recursive. At the end of the day, these are just, for, it's still a, just a regression filter, and it's just a technique at which you get the regression coefficients out. Yes. And because they're orthonormal, it gives you a bunch of benefits. Yeah, for sure. But computation. It, it, makes, it makes it doable. It's efficient. It's efficient. It's a, yeah, it's efficient, and it, kill, it reduces the round off. I've, I've done up to like 31, 35 order regressions on 64 point data. It just does it. And, and you can verify that by taking a look at your curve and see how well you're mimicking it. And it, as you know, it's a, whereas before, when I first did this back in 2009, I just grabbed a simple regression fit thing. And once I got to about ninth order, you could see it, it was starting to diverge and I, not. I know with savitsky Golay that it, it um, uh, maintains the moments of data. One of the advantages of it. Does this also do that? I, 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 I'm looking at this as, as, um, as you know, what, what it looks like, you know, with and without. Uh, let me let me show you what I've done so far. Maybe that will. Uh, so anyway, so I actually programmed this thing up to to try it out on some data. So let's see. So there is uh, here is here is my. You're getting used to these yet? Here are these little tent-like spectra, H and V. And there it is filtered with Spitzky Golay, okay, to get rid of the clutter. And here it is with a, with a, and it was a, using a 16 point kernel and a th third order fit. And here is using a five block, so another 16, uh, 16 point kernel, but you only overlap four of the points. So it's, it's kind of similar, but I'm doing that overlap and, and averaging. And so, and so what do you see difference here is you see that it, it doesn't, and this is maybe why they they didn't pursue this, because when you do a, a window win notch thing, you see this beautiful notch in the spectrum, and here you go, where's the notch? There ain't no notch over in this one. There there's some notch there, with a five block, sixteen point overlap. You you can see your notch for sure. No notch in the horizontal. Yep. In each case, you're doing a third order. But a big notch in the vertical. But, yeah. Why is that? It's just the nature of that nature of that signal. I mean, I don't understand the. There's no vertical. I mean, there's no horn. I don't know what I'm saying. Anyway, I don't understand why there would be no notch. That's just the nature. Of the, yeah. Yeah. Are you using the same order in each? So, case? let's see. I can't see it from over there. I mean, it ain't bad. Okay, what do we got left here? We started off with over you know 30, uh, 32, 34, almost 35 dB a signal. And down we're, we're we're down here, and now we're down to you know minus you know minus um, give you minus ten. So it's attenuated. Uh, it doesn't to your eye is not very attractive, but it indeed it Just did. Just trying to figure out what causes the horizontal polarization to be broadened compared to the vertical polarization. 
Well, the horizontal Charlie moving the same same scale. I don't know. Well, yeah. we're not. Look at the horizontal spectrum in the original in the top left. Yeah. It's actually different. Than I know the that. that. That's but my question. Why? It's oh, just uh, maybe it's insects because uh, insects um, would be stronger in the horizontal. We, we often saw this with, this is, he's talking about the- That little ear, rabbit ear thing? Double. Yeah, 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 that's another lecture. Um, that's has, it just has to do with when you scan clutter and how many dominant targets you have and the way they interfere with each other. We have found like, oh, you know, yeah. these two, two, two uh, you know, when you have a couple of dominant clutters, I've, I've simulated that, you actually can have a, uh, this clutter signal bu building up and then it drops down like 10 dB right at zero velocity and then jumps back up to where it was. It's just the nature of the, of the signal that's out there. Okay, so I love this discussion. This is really great, but it's um, 537 at so you can leave right any time you want. So yeah. um, I, would, I would suggest, I don't know, do you have a conclusion slide you could put up or something like that? Oh, this is much. This oh, is maybe a, not. Um, we can. I would like I, to thank John for his presentation and give him some applause. <laughs> um, I think John has offered to stay another hour. So everyone who wants to continue for another hour is very welcome to do that. So but I'm going try. to continue to. Uh, to stop the official presentation okay. here, okay, and Ricky, you can you. discuss as long as you thank, want. Thank you for ending Thanks, this. Thanks, John. <laughs>